Hello and welcome to the Horticulturalists. I'm Stephen Ryan. I'm Matthew Lucas and we do post every week so do hit subscribe if you want to follow our continuing adventures of rare and unusual plants. Exactly. Mr Ryan, I'm feeling a classroom vibe coming on. I dressed for a classroom vibe as well. You did? Yes, I'm, this, yes is, Mr. Ryan. this is trendy young teacher mode. Oh, is it? Yes, supposedly. Hashtag. Yes. So we are going to talk today about that dreadful subject that people find really difficult and that's the botanical names of plants. Uh -huh. And we're going to hopefully demystify some of them. Okay. We're also hopefully going to educate people about some of the meanings and things, explain how it all works, uh, and then people will get more confident with botanical names. And once you know a botanical name, you can hang everything else around it. <sighs> okay. The only Latin I can bring to this table is Tempus Fugit and Carpe Diem, which is appropriate. Let's get behind the desk. All right, to school. To school. <laughs> where do we start? Where we do, we, can we just, where do we start? All right, well, I suppose we should have a slight history session first. Yes, yes. Most people are aware that the basics for plant names yep. are two words, a genus and a species name. Now, I'm not super clear on this, so yeah. let's, let's spell right. it out. All right, the genus name is the first name you'll see on any printed plant label. Yeah. So the genus is like your surname. It's something that groups a whole group of people who are related together. There would be a mob of Lucases, potentially. Yeah. There would obviously be a flock of Ryans <laughs> somewhere. It means that all those plants are generally related. People are aware of genera names like rhododendron, for Camellia. instance, and Camellia. Yes. There's a whole range of them. And in fact, we use a lot of botanical names in common parlance anyway. We're yes. quite used to that. Yes. It's the difficult ones that people often have trouble with. So, you know, they're the ones that people stumble over. Yes. So, okay. So the genus name links plants together. Yes. The species name yes. is there to designate the individual. So okay. there's a, a, a mob of Lucases, yes. but there's one Matthew. In fact, there are many Matthew Lucases. You only need to Google it, but let's <laughs> yeah, not confuse Yeah, but that. they're not related to you necessarily. <laughs> this metaphor is not a good one, but yeah. I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. So it pins it down to more the individual. Yes. So if it's got a white flower and it's in the rhododendron genus, it could be rhododendron Elba. Often the species name has some sort of descriptive thing, but it can be all sorts of things. It can be commemorative, it can be geographical, it can be from ancient mythologies, yeah. uh, it can be uh, a local name. Now, the thing we need to know about it is, yes, the genus and species name. There are higher levels, uh, family and what have you. There are lower levels, there are wild varieties, there are selected plants, which are called cultivars. Forms. Forms, yeah. Which... Yeah, but basically it comes down to those two names. Okay, let's stick to the... Yeah, the genus and species. We'll stay in the yeah. lane. And and it was first worked out in a, a formal sense by Carl von Linn. The father of modern taxonomy. Exactly. Yes. And in fact, his name was originally von Linn. He's better known as Linnaeus because he was a bit affectatious and he decided to Latinize his own name. Ah, so all this whole nomenclature is built upon status, anxiety and delusions of grandeur. It would seem so. <laughs> yes, so there you go. Now, I wanted to make a couple of comments uh, as we're moving along. One is pronunciations. Yes, and people have told me off. Yeah, and look, I tell people off sometimes too before okay. I think it through. Pronunciations are one of those things that you have to understand. There is no living Roman who could come and say, this is how you pronounce it. Most of the words are Latinized. There's oodles of Greek and Aramaic and God knows what else in there. So. There's letters in the alphabet that we use that they wouldn't have had in ancient Rome, or high Latin, and they had low Latin for the plebeians. Yeah. If a, an ancient Roman came back today, they wouldn't actually be I'd able watch, to pronounce. I'd watch that film. But yes, yeah. yes, I would too. Okay. So anyhow, with pronunciations, yes. do your best. If you actually pronounce... <laughs> that is a good philosophy of life, yes. Stephen, right? Yeah. Do your best, viewers. So the thing about it, though, is if you learn the botanical name, yeah. It does give you a hook to hang everything off. Yep. If, for instance sake, I meet you for the first time. Hello, I, Stephen Ryan. I will be introduced and somebody will say to me, that's Matthew Lucas, and I will then promptly forget your name because I'm not really good with people's names. But as I meet you time and time again, your name will stick because I find out different things. I know you drive a Lamborghini. Um, <laughs> I know your favourite tipple is a martini. I don't know who this fantasy Lucas is. But, <laughs> but you know what I mean? Once yep. I get more 
things about you together, the name will then stick in my head better. People will argue that, oh, we should be using common names. Yes. And there's very good reasons not to. Uh, it's, okay. Yeah. <laughs> it is kind of easier to remember a common name, you know. Well, like, yeah, yeah. I'm like to think of one now. Fox Glove. Fox Glove. Yeah. Or... Forget me not. I'll, I'll throw a few in there for you, Matthew. Um, there's lots of common names. Now, some of them have credence because they're being used for a long time. Yep. They're well known over a large area. Yep. And so, yeah, if you say Fox Glove in Australia, we know what we're talking about. Yes. If you say it in England or America, we know what we're talking about. Yep. You don't necessarily have to use Digitalis, which is the botanical name. Yep. There's not that many plants that have a common name that is really well attached to that one plant over a large area. But Fox Glove is perhaps one of them. It is one of them. Universal um, no. Bluebell, on the other hand, is hopeless because in England it's a bulb, yep. a sort of skillery bulb. Yep. In Scotland it's a campanula. In Australia it's a Wallenbergia. And in America there's about five different genera of plants that are called bluebells because they all have bluebell-like flowers. Mm. So Not an imaginative common name. No, no. Uh, well, it's sort of descriptive but it yeah. doesn't help okay. and also some plants can have many common names they do from region to region yeah okay so you've proven that we all need to brush up our latin you we do okay. and and i think we need to at this point probably point out one of do life plug one of life's great pleasures is to have in your possession <laughs> a book on botanical names now one of life's great pleasures yeah viewers. yeah that's right exactly and this is my favorite one i didn't know that my life was incomplete but it is now this one is stern's dictionary of plant names for gardeners by um, william t stern we'll put the link below to this book yeah i've got several botanical name books but yep. this is probably the best one i think for my purposes it covers most of the commonly used plant names so you know species names can be repeated time and time again so yep. there can be a montana meaning from the mountains in lots of different genera so you know things like that are in here so that right. you can look it up and say oh montana oh of the mountains okay. obviously <laughs> um and it also has lots of commemorative names and explains who it was the plant was named after, yes. which is fantastic yes. trivia. So get yourself a good botanical dictionary and then look up the plant names yes. because it will then, once you know what the plant name comes from, even if it has no real practical connection to the plant, because they often don't. I mean, somewhere here, we've got some commemorative names like, for instance, sake, Budlia. Uh, Named after? Uh, after the Reverend Buddle. The Reverend Buddle. Yes. Now, the Reverend Buddle was a friend of Linnaeus's. English? And, or? An English reverend. Mm -hmm. And he had this genus of plants named after him, the butterfly bushes, as they're sometimes known. <coughs> Commonly known as. And when Linnaeus named it, he misspelt the reverend's name. So the name is B-U-D-D-L-E-J-A. -E Do you know what? I have never, I, look, I am also the world's worst speller, but yeah. I'm looking at your tag and it is B-U-D-D-L-E-J-A. I have never realised that Budlia is spelt with a J. And because it, it shouldn't, shouldn't be. be. <laughs> <laughs> it should have been an I and not a J and lots of... So why can't we just correct it? Because you can't. Once a plant name why? has been put into the what? lexicon it's of plant in stone? More or less. While we're on this Budlia, this is Budlia... Colvilliae. Yes, named after a gentleman called Colville. Colville. Yeah. Oh, okay. So the Reverend Buddle and Mr. Colville came both together got... <laughs> in gorgeous yes. union. And they probably never met each other. I think Colville was a much later person. He would have been alive 50 or 100 years after the Reverend Buddle died. Just to confirm, the Budlia is the genus, genus. and Colvilliae is the species. Little fine point when you see the names written down, the genus name is always spelt with a capital letter. Yeah. The species name is always spelt with a lowercase letter. Yeah. And if it's a cultivar, a variety... Now, is cultivar and variety the same meaning? It can be interchangeable. Cultivar is cultivated variety. It just means one that's shown up in cultivation. We have before us a table of beautiful plants. Yep. Now, most of these plants I bought along because they have names of interest. Yes. So they tell us something about the plant. Okay. Or not, as the case may be, because <laughs> uh, that can happen as well. Yeah. Uh, and so we might run through a few of them. Now, I mentioned Montana a minute ago. Yep. Here we have Oricaria Montana. Or which is a Montana. rare conifer from New Caledonia, yes. which you don't think of as mountainous, but it does have a ridge of reasonably high hills in the middle. Yeah. This is the highest altitude one. It's commonly known as the summit oricaria in New Caledonia. Okay. So Montana. And oricaria as a name is interesting because that is a descriptive name of a tribe of American Indians where the first oricaria was found, the oricanas. So this... New Caledonian tree's name bears very little relation <laughs> to its actual geographic location. 
Exactly, and that's one of the issues. I mean, there was a, there's a bulb that some people might be familiar with that for a long time was known as Skilla Peruviana. Mm. It's had a name change since, but the Peruviana's still there. And people always assume that it came from Peru. Yeah. No, it was actually brought to England on a ship called the Peru. <laughs> so, so <laughs> like in fact, Paddington Bear. Yeah. So sometimes these things don't sort of fit. Okay, Doc. What's next? All right, I've got a plant here that I think is really interesting, and of course, it's been written about, talked about to the nth degree. Mm. But one thing I very rarely hear about is the derivation of the name uh -huh. for this particular plant. Which now, is? Well, it's commonly known rather inappropriately as the Woolamai Pine. Woolamai Pine. Now, Woolamai is fine because that's where it comes from. That's the national park up in New South Wales yes. where this tree was discovered yes. only a couple of decades ago. It's called Woolemia, yeah. which is appropriate. Yes. So that's its genus name. Yeah. Now, it's been called Woolemia nobilis which would noble, noble or large and it does and it is but there's a slightly double entendre thing going on here yes. because the man who discovered this tree in a gorge in the Woolamai National Park yes. his surname is Noble ah so they have actually done this sort of interesting little play on words yeah so most people will see nobilis and assume noble important whatever which it is yep. but in actual fact as much as anything it's named after its discoverer ha so and there you go. Is it a pine? And that is that is something that does annoy me. It is not a pine. It's in the Oracaraceae family, so it's related to the cowries uh, and, and, and the Oracarias. And this Oracaria. Yeah. yeah. So, so these it, are all ancient uh, ancient species. Yeah, they're they? ancient conifers. They would yeah. have been around in the days of the dinosaur. Pine is a fairly inappropriate term to have lumped on it. I can mm. sort of understand how it happened. I'm not keen on the common name okay. that they've applied to it. So Willemia nobilis, named after Mr. Noble. On to the next. All right, well, we might as well finish with one of the other relatives of the uh, Willemi pine, Agathus. Agathus. Now, Agathus comes from a Greek word meaning ball of wool. And apparently okay. it comes from the fact that the female cones, when they're first forming, look like a little ball of wool. Ah. So Can it I doesn't say, help much. Now, I know that it's not, but this doesn't look particularly healthy. No, but it is. It's perfectly healthy. Is this deciduous? No. It's ever, well, it's ever brown. Ever brown. Uh, uh, it's ever brown until it gets tall enough that the giant mowers of New Zealand can't pluck the leaves off because birds don't see brown well. <gasps> So this so plant... It's a, it's a defense mechanism. Yeah, it's developed this color. It's the only uh, agathus that starts off this seriously brown color to, that I'm aware of. Wow. And it's the only one from New Zealand. Uh, the others come from New Caledonia and Australia and other places where the giant mowers didn't live. So this one has developed a defense mechanism. And now there are no giant mowers, but never mind. It hasn't heard You it. don't know that yet. Yeah. A quick science question then. Isn't photosynthesis governed by chlorophyll? Green? Yes, the green. So it how is. does this photosynthesize? It's, it's masked its chlorophyll visually. So the chlorophyll is still there. Mm -hmm. It's still got green pigment in it. When it gets taller than a mower, uh, it will in fact go green. That's extraordinary. Uh, so the green pigment is there. It's just that our, our eyes can't see it. The reason I brought this plant along yep. was mainly for the fact that it's Agathus australis. Now, people will assume automatically it's assume... From Australia. Australia. And it's not. It's from ha. New Zealand. But that <laughs> Australis means southern. And that's right. why our country was called Australia, because it's the southern continent. So that's a New Zealand native tree that has Australis in its name, and it does confuse people no end. Next. And next, I want to talk about a plant that is a piece of, uh -huh. I guess, taxonomic tautology uh -huh. uh, is where I'm going with this and one. That's tricky. And that, look yeah. at that flower, though. It's oh beautiful. Goodness. Now, this is a plant from the Canary Islands. Yes. There's only a couple of species in the is genus. It something canariensis? It's worse than that. There's about three species. One of them comes from Ethiopia or somewhere like that. Yep. This one does, in fact, come from the Canary Islands. Yep. So its species name is canariensis, uh -huh. and that often works. Yep. But the botanist or taxonomist that named this genus named the genus Canarina, which also Canarina. means from the Canaries. Oh, so it's, so it's a Canary, Canary Island plant from the Canary Islands. Canary, Canary. Yeah, so hence the tautology. Uh, just a quick aside though, it's early winter, yeah. and this is just coming into its own. 
and yep. flowering. Yeah. What an amazing plant. Yes, it's a it's a semi scandent climber in the Campanula family from the Canary Islands, at least this species. Yeah. It's winter growing. It is slightly frost tender, so you do need to have, you know, even very mild frosts will knock it down. So you do have to have good frost protection. It grows well in a pot and it dies down to almost dahlia like tubers in the summer. Some things are given names that have some applicability to the plant, as yes. in descriptive of some part of the plant. Yep. Now, this is a camellia from northern Vietnam yep. called Camellia amplexicolis, and we're going to do a proper plant profile on, on this particular plant. What's the last bit? Amplexicolis, and that's why I bought it along. Amplexicolis. Now, amplexicolis means Corpus. joined directly to the stem. <laughs> there is no leaf stem. You know how most plants have a, have a leaf stem and yeah. then the leaf is attached at the end? Yeah. And plexicolis means without a stem. Oh, okay. It's descriptive and it, it actually tells you something about the plant. Yeah. This is an osmanthus. Osmanthus. Uh, now the, are they, they're famous for the fragrance of yes, their flowers. Yes, they, they have fabulously fragrant flowers, most of the species. Mm. Um, it isn't about its genus name, which is somewhat obscure. So it's not about its genus name that I'm uh, picking this plant up, yeah. but it's Species name is Heterophyllus. Heterophyllus. So hang on, Osmanthus Heterophyllus. Can you figure out where a Heterophyllus would work? I think I'm too frightened. Yeah, now. yeah, I thought you might be. It just means various oh. leaf. Hetero as in lots of different. Yeah. And it does. You have a look at that plant. Oh, I'm uh, just noticing. Yeah, it's got ah, an see, oval be, leaf. Yeah, and, and, and spiky holly-like leaves. Yes, oh my goodness. So it has heterophyllises. That's amazing. <laughs> I've got a few other little plants here I wanted to have a, a chat about. Yes. Now this is a little succulent that people in Europe and North America will be well and truly familiar with. Yes. They're known as sempervivums. Now sempervivum means ever living as yes. in evergreen. Now this particular one is one called calcarium. Calcarium. Now, calcium. And the reason it's called calcarium is that it comes from limestone hills in the Dolomites and places like that. So it's telling you about where it comes from. All right. So, calcarium. This is a little anemone. Oh, very pretty. It's lovely, and it's called anemone blander. Now, that seems cruel. I'm assuming blander means bland, and that is not. It's very pretty. Yeah. Bland means mild or charming or quaint. Well, anemone blander, I think you are anything but. Yes. So, the name doesn't really help. All right. On the other hand, if we have a snowdrop. Yes. Oh, have, common name. That common is name, which is reasonably, reasonably appropriate. Reasonably appropriate. Yeah. Now, they're called Galanthus, and Galanthus. if you translate their name, uh, at least the first part comes from Greek. I think the second part might be Latin, I'm not sure. Gala is Greek for milk, yep. so white. Logical. Anthus, flower. Right. So it's a milk flower, or as we would call it, snowdrop in yep. this day and age. And this particular one was named after Mr. Elwiz, so it's Galanthus elwizii. Mm -hmm. Now, I did bring some oxaluses down because I just can't help myself. Stephen is obsessed with oxalis. Now, I brought these ones down because they illustrate a few points. Yes, that's got amazing leaves. Now, we've got this one here. Mm -hmm. This is Oxalis purpurea alba. Purpurea alba. Well, alba we know is white. Purpurea is purple. Purple. Yes. Purple white. Yeah. So what happened with this one, the first form of it that was discovered was a purpley pink one. Yeah. So the species was called Oxalis purpurea. Yeah. Then they find a white form of it, so they call it Elba, which is completely confusing to people when they do know the meanings of some of these things. These two are both named differently, but for the same characteristic using different words. Okay. So we have here Oxalis pubescens. Yes. I'm resisting the urge to be a schoolboy. Yes, well, good. I'm glad to hear that. It means it's it's furry, it, it's hairy, it's pubescent. And if you look at it closely, it has got little... Oh, um, yeah, it's got furry leaves. Yeah, furry, furry leaves. Stems, yeah. This one is Oxalis tomentosa, which also means with furry, fluffy leaves. Yeah. So this is a good segue, then, to DNA in the modern era and uh, the whole name change palaver. Yeah. That's the other thing that annoys the average home gardener beyond belief, including Such you apparently, myself. is that the names are changing and they're changing incredibly rapidly at the mm. moment. What we've got to remember you, is that nature is dynamic. Yeah. Mr. Ryan, I noticed this extraordinary plant on your teacher's table. Yes. What is the story with this name? All right, well, it's one of those entertaining plants that I encourage people to buy for children to get them inspired in gardening, I have to say, because yeah. kids like weird stuff, yeah. funnily enough. 
and it's a corkscrew rush. Uh -huh. And you can see it has this amazing corkscrewy foliage. Yep. Now, this is a cultivar, mm -hmm. basically. It's been discovered, well, maybe not a cultivar, a variety that was discovered in the wild. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, laughing because I'm seeing its name. Yes. And so it's a rush which are known as Juncus, 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 yes, Fusus. And this variety is called Spiralis, which is quite an appropriate name for it. If it was given that name, it's a Latin version name, yeah. if it was given that name before the 1950s, then that name is there to stay. Mm -hmm. If it was named after that period, then it's, a, it's an incorrect name and shouldn't be Spiralis. Why? because it's a Latin name and they shouldn't use Latin names for varieties and cultivars after 1950 oh something or another. Goodness. So I'm assuming it was probably discovered earlier than that so the name can stay okay. with it. And it's a really interesting and different sort of plant. We forgive you. Yes. Juncus effusus spiralis. To finish off with, we've got a yes. couple of other things. Mr. Japonica. Yes. <laughs> now, now, interesting you mention this because as a child growing up in England, I always refer to those as japonicas. Yes, and they do here in Australia as well. Yes. These are a flowering shrub that I would probably call flowering quince because they're related to quinces. Yes. But japonica is one of those common names that stuck. So people then appropriated the species name as a common name. Right, and is the japonica meaning it was from Japan? Yes, and so the confusion arises now, of course, that virtually anything that has a Japanese origin and has japonica in its name, yeah. people assume that it's related. It's a japonica. Yes, and it's not. But it's, it's not, because that's not a japonica, oh my no. goodness. Yeah, so it just means comes from Japan. This one is Clayera japonica in its yep. variegated form, yep. and it's in the camellia family. Beautiful. And it's a lovely shrub. You yep. don't see it grown very often, no. makes a great cup specimen. That's why you have it. The Canomalies, of course, uh, one of the species is also Japonica. Yep. So that's where all the confusion came about. Yeah, well, I have to say the, the where they come from bit is great mm. because at least it gives you a, a, a an area in which you can then yeah. start to look where the plant oh, comes from. The last plant. All right, so we've got two plants here, one of which is a classical Berberus, yep. or Barberry is the common name that's reasonably accepted. Right. And this is a Mahonia. Now, Mahonia was named after a gentleman by the name of Marne, M-A-H-O-N. Good Irish fella, I imagine. We probably should be saying Marnia, not Mahonia, but it doesn't matter anymore mm. because the Mahonias have now been sunk into the Berberuses, so they're just a group within the genus Berberus, and that's because of the DNA. So this is that modern view of taxonomy, which is really about genetics. Yeah. So hang on, what is this, what was it called, Mahonia... Nervosa. Nervosa. Meaning it's got... Meaning it's nervous. No, it means it's got <laughs> the nerves that run through the leaves. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I see. And now what's it called? Berberus. Berberus. Nervosa. So Mahonia does not exist anymore. No, as a genus, a, at least if you're following the botanists that have decided to do this, and there's mm. probably botanists that are, are dead against it. Revolutionaries. So, yeah. And that little Berberus goes under the wonderful name of Berberus stenophylla corallina compacta. <laughs> compacta? means it's small. Yeah, it's small and tight. The rest so, of it sounds like an unfortunate sexually transmitted disease. Well, stenophylla, stenophylla. Uh, filler is leaf, so it's got to do with the foliage. I'm not quite sure what the steno is. Corallina is about the corollas, the flowers. Uh, and compactor obviously means small. Right. And so in some cases it's quite descriptive, but in some cases it's... I'd like to finish off with something that really makes me laugh. Okay. Some taxonomists are quite romantic when they name a plant. Yep. They'll, they'll pick on uh, the ancient daughter of the king of Palmyra to name a plant. Some taxonomists, I reckon, have been having a really bad day when they name plants. So when it comes to naming a plant, some taxonomists will pick on something that just seems completely inappropriate. Now, there's a lovely little North American woodland plant called Uvularia grandiflora. Grandiflora? Bigger flower. Bigger now, flower. when you say something like grandiflora, it's always in comparison to other species. It doesn't mean it has a giant flower. It's mm. just got a bigger flower than other species. Which, so if something has a descriptive term like gigantea, grandiflora, uh, pygmia, it's all about it being in comparison right. with other species. So you could find an enormous pygmia. You could. Quite easily. It's just the smallest of even bigger ones. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, so some of those things aren't that helpful. Right. Uvularia, the guy who named it, and I must see if I can find out who did this, named it after that floppy piece of skin that hangs down in the back of your throat. Now, how romantic is that? And how bizarre. That's, that's almost like a fetish. That's weird. Yeah, it is weird. You know, I mean, they do have little lemony-coloured nodding bells. So that, sort of... that's, that's a long bow, though. Yeah. So it, I, I just wanted to finish off by pointing out that, you know, I guess if some taxonomists are having a bad day 
or life is just miserable. They'll go out and they'll name a plant after, after an something. Obscure body oh, oh, it's just woeful. Now, there's one other point I want to make, and that is commemorative names. Yes. Named after persons such as Ryan, but a great example which you always go for is Clivia. Yes, yes. Tell me your Clivia story, Stephen, and well, we will all ignore it and continue to call them Clivias. No, you won't, because you're all going to call them Clivias. Clivias. Uh, I pointed... So What's the what's the protocol? All right. Well, now there isn't, as I said at the beginning of this whole video, there isn't any set rules and regulations about some of these things. However, however, <laughs> one thing that I was taught when I was a young um, uh, horticultural student by yes. my nomenclature teacher at the time. Yes, you was got it eventually then? a nomenclature teacher. Was that yeah, their title? that was their task? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So he said to me, and I am sticking with it that. If it's a commemorative name, mm. then you probably should pronounce it as close as you can to the original form of the name. Because the person it was named after was Lady Clive, who I believe was related to Clive of India. Right. And I also believe she was the first one to flower this South African ah. plant. Yeah, so I was taught to pronounce it as close as possible to the original form. Yeah. Which makes sense, because she wasn't Lady Cliv. She was Lady Clive. So, and that's why it should be Marnia, not Mahonia. It's yeah. why it should be Dahlia, not Dahlia. Mm -hmm. It's why it should be Fuchsia, not Fuchsia. But, you know, we can become complete pedants with this, but... You it, can. Yes, and I will. <laughs> yes, so I will stick with Clivia. Uh, I know I will have huge arguments, particularly but with have people... You, have you let Dahlia go? Have you let Fuchsia go? Fuchsia I can't quite let go of. Uh, I find Fuchsia just a little bit hard to get my tongue around. Yeah. Dahlia, I'm so happy you're, you're to being adopt. Selective. Well, we all will be. This is the other thing. You, you know, I will grow gazanias in the garden. Other people might want gazanias. I don't know. At the end of the day, just go for it and enjoy it. That, that's <sighs> my final piece of advice on plant naming. Okay, Mr. Ryan, thank you for our Latin lesson today. We do post every week, so if you want to see what we're up to next week and what could it be, Mr. Ryan? I think we'll do something just a little bit <laughs> easier, perhaps, out next of week. the classroom. Yeah, we'll go out of the classroom and we'll probably do a nice plant profile I'm just to triggered. calm me down. Triggered to yeah. my childhood trauma in classrooms. Anyway, yeah. thank you for watching and we look forward to seeing you next week. Goodbye all.